If you've ever asked yourself, as a Christian, how do I respond when fill in the blank? Then today's episode is for you. Sometimes on Therapy and Theology, we answer only one question, but other times we'll cover several, and today is one of those days. Because we're moving quickly through these questions, don't forget to download the free listener guide my team put together using the link in the show notes. Okay, are you ready? Let's dive into today's content. As a Christian, how do I respond when my family or friend group is split politically? My short answer, announced right here, Lisa Turkhurst for president. Well, I mean, hey, is there anything else? Okay, out that there? one came out of the blue. But that Thank one, you, Jim. you shocked all of us on that one. Well, okay. I mean, speaking of shock, let's go there. I mean, that was my attempt to be funny. If, are we really shocked anymore about the culture and the environment? So, how, no matter what the question is, it's a mess out there right now. America is in what I call that trauma limbic brain and limbic responses of fight, flight, or freeze, seemingly mainly fight. So, to really, really acknowledge where, in essence, the culture is, including maybe just our friends or family, can be like, it's. this is not where it used to be even 20, 30 years ago. It's a very volatile playing field right now. Okay. That's yeah. for me to acknowledge this. It's really, I think, unprecedented times. Yeah, I, I think we need a guide. Mm-hmm. So we need a guide to help us. It's a topic I've been studying for the last two and a half years, and y'all are going to be like, Joel, for real, is this what you're going to say? And I'm going to say it, and I'm going to try to defend it just a little bit. Uh, We need humility. We desperately need humility in this conversation. Humility is a protection, a prevention, and a preservation. Humility protects us from thinking too low of ourselves. Mm -hmm. It prevents us from thinking too high of ourselves, and it preserves us in the life of Christ. So when we apply humility to the conversation of politics and disagreement, Mm -hmm. what humility I think is going to allow us to do is to have um, this deep sense of confidence in our conviction, Mm -hmm. compassion, in the way that we communicate. And above all, it always reminds us that you and I are committed to the kingdom of God at all costs. Um, And so if we can frame our relationships and our conversations through that lens of humility, uh, I think it's gonna lead to healthy relationships and will help us know when we ought to speak and when we ought to might be hesitant. I think that's really good. For me, I have to first ask myself the question, do I have the emotional capacity to have this kind of conversation Good. right now. Mm-hmm. And if I don't have the emotional capacity, I need to be honest that I don't really want to say things that I could potentially regret later, or I need to do a little more research on this. That's good. And so if you don't have the emotional capacity or you don't feel like you're informed enough, it's okay to hit the pause button and say, let's revisit this another time. But if you do have the emotional capacity to talk about it, I think taking a big step back instead of making assumptions why this person believes the way that they do, and you've taught me this, Jim, get curious, not furious, Mm -hmm. and start asking questions. Like, help me understand that perspective a little better. Or help me understand the story in your life that kind of got you to that place. Not accusing, not making assumptions, Mm -hmm. but really truly getting the desire to connect with that person heart to heart, even if you never agree on the issues. Because here's what I know, we're all very divided sometimes Mm -hmm. in the way we think about things, our Mm -hmm. political views, even our interpretation of scripture. But we can be very united in our tears. We can be very united in the hurts that have gotten us to the place where we believe like we believe, the compassion that we have for certain things, the righteous anger we have about other things, Mm -hmm the need for justice, you know, those are places where if we can take a step back and, and, and not so much fight to try to talk someone else into our political view, but rather take a step back and just say, help me understand what got you to this place. That's not you watering down what you believe, mm. but that's truly providing a pathway for actual healthy conversation. That's so good. Okay, so let's go on and say, when I'm a Christian, how do I respond when? And let's tackle one other. When one of my friends or family members is going through loss. I guess I can start and I would just say um, uh, to sit with them in their tears and to sit with them in their emotion and sit with them in the reality of their grief. Mm -hmm. Um, Paul uses a second person plural in the New Testament often, alalon, and it's a reciprocal pronoun. 
and the idea of it, it's the word one another. So when you're reading Paul letters and, you're, and you read one another, you want to think about it this way. With the intensity that I love you, the expectation is that you ought to love back and give back. And so when somebody is sitting in grief, the, the level of grief that they are walking through, some of the the most helpful and hopeful things that you can do as a friend, I believe, with that person is to match that grief and to sit with them in that sorrow, to acknowledge it. I was reading something the other day and um, it was, I don't even know, it was just a novel. And in the novel, the character said, when you give somebody a hug that's going through some suffering, don't be the first person to let go. Well, I just thought that was so yeah. fantastic because you never know how long that a hug, mm-hmm. let them be the first one to start the release so that you know. And so in the same way, when you're sitting in grief with somebody, sit in grief with them um, and, and be present, wholly present in, in those moments. I think it's really good to maybe even mark our calendar and remind ourselves to be present when other people go back to normal life. Yeah. Wow. And one of the practical ways that I think we can be present is think of a moment in that person's day where they're going to have a need. Yeah. For example, um, maybe when they wake up in the morning, they are going to feel the intensity of the loneliness and some practical things they may need, just very practically speaking, or what kind of coffee do they like? What kind of creamer do they like? Um, everyone needs toilet paper and paper towels and baggies. And so maybe just send that person a text and say, you know, um, I'm praying for you today. I'm thinking about you today. I'm here for you today. And I've left a a back of some things that if I were you, practically speaking, I would need today. And I didn't want you to have to run to the grocery store. Care package. Yeah. Yeah. And so instead of putting the pressure on the other person, let me know if you need something. Because honestly, when I'm in grief, I can't even think straight. I don't want to reach out and let somebody know. Another practical thing is I had a friend that got a really severe diagnosis. And I asked her, I said, a lot of people are going to be calling you right now and asking for an update or what you're feeling. What do you want our conversations to be about? Mm -hmm. And she shocked me. And she said, I don't want to talk about the disease. I don't want to talk about the prognosis. I don't want to talk about what the doctors are projecting for my future. I want to have conversations of joy Mm -hmm. because conversations around joy make me feel like a normal person. Mm -hmm. And so even though the grief with her was the, her own diagnosis that she was facing, asking her, what do you want our conversations to be about really helped me to know my assignment wasn't so much to get all the latest updates. My assignment was to think of joyous things to talk to her about. So good. Now, I'd like to just add in to what you all so eloquently said and so practically said. I, I do this on a regular basis with myself and with others I get to work with, and that is first for a moment, pause before you even maybe think about the other person for a moment, whether that's on social media and somebody's put out a post of grief or loss or a diagnosis, or but pause first and go internal and say, whoa, 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 whoa. Why, what's going on for me? What is this hitting in me? Mm, Sometimes true. there's that PTSD and just, where am I? Am I a little dysregulated? Am I scared? You can pay attention first. That's radical self-care. That's not you being selfish and say, what is this hitting in me? Again, you might journal and write about it. Then that great Jewish concept, I still get to work with Hasidic and Orthodox Jews and a lot of my therapy work, and I love it. Um, and the idea that's still there of sitting Shiva and to come in and be with that person, a concept of being with them and not of them. Of them is I'm, I'm in them and trying to say things and maybe I just need to stop talking, but I will be there and you're going to sense the gift of my presence and also not giving any unsolicited advice or how you brilliantly did with your friend to say, what do you need or maybe what do you not need? Thank you. I'd like the conversations to be normal or about happiness or about joy. And when you're entering that arena, if you will, of any level, even just on the phone with a friend, I think a lot of people are coming in ungrounded, a little dysregulated. I don't know what to say. People do it at caskets all the time, coming up and say, no, brother, he's with the Lord now, or, or, you know, isn't God good? And it's like, we we just say some crazy things sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I think that's coming out of our own stuff, and we're coming in dysregulated. Back to what we've said, even there. We can prepare in times of strength for coming times of weakness or vulnerability and say, Jimbo, if you're about to walk into this thing or call or even respond on socials, what is going on in you 
before you respond or possibly even react. Mm. So, good. so good. Okay. What do I do as a Christian when I find out that a friend of mine is in a marriage that is really struggling? So as a Christian, how do I respond to that? Same thing I'm going to go back to, same song, second verse. I want to go internal and say, I just got that news. Sometimes, again, if it's hysterical, it's historical, but just ask yourself. You go to the mall, you know that directory, the red dot says you are here. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What is this hitting in me before I make a move? What's going on? I would ask myself, too, because you never know. I never know. Is this person going to want some time with me? And if they do truly assessment, how much of my time do I have to give to that person. And also, if I'm going to go be with that person, I wish I had a better way to say this, but am I going to do my term FAUX, faux counseling, fake counseling, surrogate counseling with the person when they may need to go themselves to an expert, to a professional counselor, to can have the time so good. and with to help them process through that? I just want to have those questions before I even engage my friend. Yeah. Also, you know, for me, I would want to get a gauge on the severity. So there's yes. a big difference between everyday struggles, you know, mm-hmm. where you're having difficulties in a marriage. But then there's a, another severity when the marriage has become destructive to one or both mm-hmm. individuals. And so depending on the severity, like everyday issues, that can be friend to friend conversations and that can be really helpful. And also acknowledging your own relationship struggles to sort of normalize, hey, it's it's okay when you're having a difficulty, but mm-hmm. here's some things that have worked for me, not expecting the other person to do everything you're suggesting. But if you understand the severity, you will know whether this needs to be a friendship conversation where you can share practical things that have worked for you, maybe a book that you've read, maybe a conference that you went to, or when it's more severe, then let me help you find someone specifically trained for that kind of issue. I can be here as your friend, but one of the best things you can do, I think, for a friend is help them connect with the right people who have the right information and education to really help deal with some of the more severe issues and struggling. Let me just say, add, if I may, from a clinical or a therapeutic standpoint, uh, what I call the MRI, if they're talking about their marriage, the MRI for me is where the marriage really is, MRI. Where are they? As you dialogue that and do your own assessment as a friend, I'm just telling you, you, you want to assess for DV, for domestic violence. Yeah. You may ask questions because it can be dangerous. You, even as a friend, giving advice, financial things, if they were to put boundaries, you have a book about that, right? That that boundary could cost them financially, right? Or are they going to go and quote you, which I see all the time, but even as a friend, let alone quoting therapy and theology or quoting the, uh, the the therapist and say, well, they just told me to. I want to have that assessment inside to know what might be the pebble in the pond that the ripples can go out. And I might get over my head, but that person, what do I do if I find out, yeah, he, he's been hitting me or she's been hitting me or this has gone on or there's this sexual stuff, infidelity going on. Hmm. I want to have that awareness of where I could get over-involved in a way that could have all kinds of implications. Yeah, I'm just saying be careful of the superhero complex, yeah, kind of what you what you had just said. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think consistently being aware of what you're mirroring back to them. That's good. You know, like you're in conversation, you're consistently mirroring back or reflecting back to them something. And is that something um, that reinforces or pushes towards potential, um, how do I say it? like extenuating difficulties or is it something that says hey we're going to acknowledge the reality of what's going on we're going to assess it and we're going to have clear boundaries of when i've met the end of my level of friendship support you know and i think we've all said that the same way uh in different ways and again remind them the truth of who they are in christ jesus i think that's one of the most important things because when when we're struggling in these areas, one of the ways the enemy tries to, what I think the enemy typically tries to do is to discount your value and worth as an image bearer of God. And so as you're reflecting truth back to them, point them back to their dignity in Christ. Point them back to what God says of them that is true of them. Point them back to um, the source of comfort, which is the scriptures. And then you be an agent of comfort, you know, Um, and yeah, process along the way. Yeah, I think it's really good to assure that friend, too, that you will pray more words for them and over them 
then you'll speak to them because that in and of itself shows that you're willing to position your heart in conjunction with the Lord yep. rather than just your own, drawing on your own thoughts and suggestions. Okay, last question, and we'll wrap up today's um, episode. But as a Christian, how do I respond when someone I do life with really closely has a strong, conflicting Christian belief to what I believe? Yeah, I mean, I would say one of the things that we absolutely need to retrieve as Christians is this thing called theological triage. So a quick example, you go uh, into an ambulance scene, somebody come, a dude has fallen off the bike, right? The ambulance gets there, the paramedics get out and they assess the situation. Yeah. And you've got two things. You've got a broken ankle and you've got bleeding out from an artery. What is the paramedic going to do? He's going to deal with the artery. Mm-hmm. If that paramedic dealt with the ankle, we would all be like, no, like yeah, this is where, right. like, no, you know? And so in the similar way, we have to do some theological triage, which actually is going to help frame how we get into disagreements, into arguments, the, the the ferocity of it or like the severity of it, I guess, is the better way to say it. So I categorize them into three areas. Um, and I get this actually from uh, a guy named Gavin Orland, who wrote an incredible uh, book called The Right Hills to Die On. I think it's phenomenal. And uh, Gavin has four, I think, and uses different words. But the way that I would phrase it is primary, secondary, and tertiary. The primary things are things that are essential to the Christian faith. We're talking about the incarnation. We're talking about Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. We're talking about the inerrancy of Scripture. These are things that make or break. Like, I'm willing to die on the hill. If there is a difference at this primary level, then there might have to be, actually, there probably will have to be a change in the fundamental relationship. Because no longer are we brothers and sisters in Christ. We're fellow image bearers of Christ. But you have not submitted yourself now to the kingship of Christ. So my relationship with you is to consistently present truth in front of you and to witness to you and to invite you back into the faith, right? So that's that's one. And I'll say we've also discussed, we've studied this before, changing, changing the dynamics of the relationship so that you recognize there's such a fundamental difference in a core essential of the faith that as long as the door's open, you can share wisdom with them, but you don't open up your heart Hard, then for least. them to share wisdom back because the foundation of their wisdom is not consistent with an absolute essential of the faith. Exactly. So that's primary. Secondary are things like, um, do you believe in baptizing infants or baptizing adults? What's your view of end times? Are you a rapture person, pre-trip, post-trip, which, you know, um, those types of things are secondary. Now, with this, it might be helpful. Actually, it's probably wise and prudent even to have a denominational separation in the sense of for the sake of harmony and for the sake of just theological conviction, um, I believe in this way. So I'm going to go to a church that kind of facilitates and, and works on the same area to build harmony and unity. But we all recognize we're part of the same family. We're a part of the same family of God. And so we can be in union with that and still have distinction of it. This should not cause division of in the family or out of the family. And what I've found more often than not is people take secondary issues and they turn them into first degree issues. And when we do that, we actually dishonor God and we dishonor our fellow brother and sisters in Christ. So having that is really important. And then the third degree uh, or the the tertiary issues are things like, what kind of music do you sing? Are you, are you, do you like uh, a full band or are you like old school acapella? You know, Uh, do you like to be in an environment that has a bunch of lights and different stuff? Or do you like pews? Are you liturgical? Are you, you know? Um, and those are things that, hey, have an opinion on and um, and with some trusted friends, you know, maybe process through it. But don't be very careful that we're not sowing seeds of discord in the family of God that allows that opinion to become something that causes disunity. Mm-hmm. And again, remember, we say it often, we don't want to violate scripture in an effort to defend scripture. And the secret is to come at anything that we're discussing with a humble heart and a gentle spirit. And we can get passionate about fighting for those primary issues, right? But we're fighting for, not against. Mm. In other words, you know, we want to have the spirit of Christ if we're trying to, you know, really bring somebody back into the truth. We're not going to do it with the spirit of animosity, but we need to have the spirit of Christ that leads the way in all of our conversations. To this day, and I've been in a lot of conversations, I've never seen anybody come to Jesus because they're like, man, you made me feel dumb. 
<laughs> right? Like I've just not, I just haven't seen it. Like, wow, you yeah. convinced me by attacking me as a person, or you convinced me by showing me how dumb I like. You know, the way it is is like there's something different about you. Mm-hmm. Like you show love and compassion even in this area of disagreement. You still have this like presence about you that yeah. is welcoming. What is that? And you're like, Jesus. It's mm-hmm. Jesus. And you're like, all right, cool. We can work with that. That's so good, Joel. Well, thank you for joining us in this rapid fire question, but some really important questions around, as a Christian, how do I respond to these various issues? Thanks so much for joining us. Hi friend, thanks for watching this video. Proverbs 31 Ministries is a nonprofit organization and our mission is to meet you and women like you with scriptural truth and encouragement in the moments you need it most. Every day we offer free biblical resources, devotions, podcasts, videos, and more, all to help women around the world know the truth and live the truth because it changes everything. Find out more about how you can get involved today by visiting us at proverbs31.org.